Welcome back to Siege Bata, Fremen and Offworlders alike. So today we're going to do something a little different. I know it's about a month late, but the devs released a video, and it was kind of a documentary. Uh, they talked to two of the devs, the creative director and the game director, for Dune Awakening. And so basically, we're going to watch the video together. I'm going to pause every once in a while to give my thoughts and opinions on what's being said or what's being shown. And... At the end, I'll give my conclusions, tie it up, and put a nice little bow on top. So let's get this thing started, shall we? Definitely liking look of the concept art my name is Joel Bylos I'm the creative director on Dune Awakening so Dune Awakening is a let me interrupt him real quick it worries me that there's all this memorabilia around him and books. I mean, there's what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Looks like fifteen books there. Not to mention the Popco figures and the um looks like an action figure there. Um a sculpture up top. Looks that looks like that might be a Chris knife or what's supposed to represent a Chris Chris knife in the background there. And of course there's the, you know, nineteen eighty four version of the Baron Harkonnen. Uh, uh what worries me is it seems like too much. I mean I understand immersing immerging yourself in the universe, but it looks staged. Survival, open world, massively multiplayer game. It is a game where players are invited to explore the world of Dune. They involve themselves in politics, they involve themselves in intrigue, they involve themselves in combat, they have to survive on the most dangerous planet in the universe. And through this experience, they come to know the factions in the world and their defeat. So, when Dune Awakening begins, you are a castaway on the planet in the deep desert, and all you have is a knife that you've made out of scrap metal. And you need to creep into enemy camps and knife them in the back and steal the water from their still suits. By the end of that stealth aspect really intrigues me. As he was talking about this, I could actually visualize what he was talking about. You're running a guild. You have a fleet of vehicles, ornithopters flying in formation, sand bikes cruising across the desert beneath them, tanks kicking up a cloud of dust as you drive to a spice blow in the distance in order to harvest for your guild. And you see in the distance another guild coming towards you, and just as you clash, you hear the rumble of a sand body coming in. That's combat in Dune Awakening. Now, what worries me about his description of combat is. How often is that going to happen? I mean, yeah, I'm sure it might happen, you know, once in a while, but... And, and I can appreciate the epic fight that would ensue around that. But how often is it going to happen? And if they want it to happen quite often, how are they going to implement systems to ensure that it happens? start out in the desert to survive now this okay this is alpha footage i understand that but it looks kind of i guess the word is Honestly and truly, it reminds me of the 
first Mass Effect. <laughs> but like I said, it's alpha footage, so it's definitely subject to change. Bring clinging to life, and in the end, you might become someone like the Baron Harkonnen, and then you try to cling to power. Arrakis is the most dangerous planet in the universe. Uh, surviving on Arrakis means that you need to prepare for sandstorms, you need to find water, it's a constant threat against uh, survival. Water discipline is an important part of survival. In the beginning, it might just be water for yourself. In the end, you might need industrial levels of water because you have industrialized your bed. Um, and the storms are an important part of survival as well. You have to find shelter in the beginning. You have nothing to your name. After a while, you will have a base and then you will be build a bigger base so that that doesn't become as important. But then you always have to go out in the desert and make sure that you can compete against the desert. Um, in the end, you might even be riding the storms uh, of the desert to actually gain access to unique resources. But you always need to return. And every time you go out, you have to be careful of the worm. Because if you get caught by the worm, there will be nothing left of you and you will leave nothing behind. Okay, now, here comes the question. If you die in the game, is that game over? I mean, I can imagine it would probably not be that you would just, you know, respawn somewhere. Like, you know, maybe if you're in a guild and you have a guild base, then you'd respawn in your guild base or whatever. But what becomes of the stuff that's on you? You know, uh... Is it, is it like extraction shooters where if you die, what you have on you gets left there? And of course, what does he mean about dying to the worm? Because that sounds a little permanent to me. With Dune, we have a particular focus on a style of combat that we like to call combined arms, and it takes all of the elements that players would expect from the books and the movies, and it puts them together in this great chaotic kind of experience. Um, so we have vehicle combat, we have abilities that you might see in the great schools in the Dune universe, we have melee combat, and we have ranged combat. And all I like the fact that the great schools, you know, Mentat, uh, Bene Gesserit, uh, Soup Doctors, you know, those all will play a part. Both in the, you know, actual, I guess you would call it PvE side of the game, and evidently the PvP side. player versus environment pve kind of combat as well as massive pvp battles for players to participate in and it's the combination of these things that really makes it feel like sandbox combat where players have the ability to you know pick their loadouts and see how they go into battle we have a broad specter of combat capabilities we have melee weapons like knives and swords we have range weapons uh, then we have ground vehicles and air vehicles, they all come with configurable capabilities like las guns, rockets, um, mini guns, things. Oh. When he said las guns, instead of saying laser guns or laser blasters or anything like that, I got very excited because using the proper terminology makes me feel like they know a little bit about what they're talking about. I mean, I've read every book up until the stuff that came out recently, like um, Sisterhood of Dune, uh, Navigators of Dune, anything that came out from Sisterhood after, I haven't read, which I'm working on Sisterhood now, but... Just using the proper terminology just gives me a little bit of hope. It, it, actually, it gives me a lot of hope. <laughs> like that. Uh, you will be fighting on foot. You'll be driving.
self-driving vehicles, to be flying in ornithopter, and it all comes together there. Um, the more coordinated you are, the better it is, the better prepared you are, the better it will be. If you're playing with someone for the first time or you didn't prepare properly, um, it will be chaotic. But if you prepare, if you coordinate, then you will perform with lethal efficiency. So the world of Arrakis is full of political intrigue. And we have this fantastic concept from the stories called Canley. And Canley is basically the rules of engagement. It's this thing called the Great Convention that defines areas of the world where players are allowed to interact in different ways. So in Dune Awakening, players will have different areas of the world that are enabled for, for example, full, full player versus player combat and areas that are safer and, and you know, that are patrolled by Sardaukar troops and kept safe. And so uh, players really have this sort of free opportunity within the sandbox to find the locations where they can fight with each other or to stay in the locations where they're safer. And that's up to the player and how they want to approach the game. Now, when it comes to Canley, first of all, I don't recall Canley being a great convention. The only great convention I know of is the Lansrod, but I digress. I'm happy to hear that there will be safe spaces well, somewhat safe spaces for players to go in because, I mean, I have been playing the closed beta for a, um, upcoming third person extraction shooter that I won't name because I'm under NDA obligation. But, uh, and it sucked going into the PvP side and being stuck as a solo with groups. But at the same time, one thing that concerns me about the safe spaces or safe places is... Will players that choose not to PvP still have access to materials to all the materials in the game? Um, so to use the example of the game that I was just closed beta testing, um, you could not really get the best gear and the best weapons in the game without without going into the PvP side. I later found out that you could, but but the thing is I don't mind having to take a long time to get there to grind you know a little bit harder because i don't want to go into pvp um which i'm not saying i will never go into pvp on this game it's just i know that i tend to play games like this solo a lot and solo is not very conducive to a pvp environment so will i be able to access you know the highest in materials the highest in gear the highest in weapons all of that without necessarily having to go into pvp sure it can take me twice as long to get it but can i do i actually have a chance to get it in June awakening we've got many different types of weapons from across the universe drawing upon the books and the movies we have las guns, Mauler pistols. Once again, with the las guns, I mean, I mean, maybe you do have an idea, but to to know the lingo and and the the the, the vocabulary of the universe just 
makes me very hopeful that they can actually pull this off the way it should be. We have scatter guns, pellet guns. Um, in addition, we have all of the sort of melee weapons you'd expect to see, Chris knives and kinjals and short swords and rapiers. And in addition to that, of course, we also have abilities that players can learn through the great schools of the universe, such as uh, Mentat abilities or Bene Gesserit skills. And you can fight other players wearing Holtzman shields. There's a, a system involved where people will want to get close because the slow blade penetrates. That also pleases me to hear because you don't see a lot of shields you don't see a lot of interaction between shields in other Doom games. Yeah, they'll have shields, but it'll basically be part of the hit pool or hit points pool. Um, but this, you know, it seems like they're going to add the depth of, you know, you get in close and you ease your blade in and you're able to penetrate the shield instead of having to basically wear it down. And uh, so you want to use melee to get through a shield in a duel like that. Um, and of course, like if people don't have shields because shields draw the sandworm, you want to make sure that you use ranged weapons. That also impresses me that they actually are taking the time to, to show an interaction between sandworms and shields in the desert now in the books shields don't just draw the sandworm shield technology drives the sandworm into a feeding frenzy but you know at least they did bring in the 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 the, the interaction so there's a there's a real interplay between systems between the way that shields interact with both the world and the environment, with sandworms, and also how they interact in close personal combat. Any time that you step onto the sands of Arrakis, you risk drawing the worm. You can multiply that by driving vehicles on the surface. You can multiply that by using shields or suspensor belts. Holtzman technology will draw the worm. I love how they, how he brings up, you know, Holtzman technology, because it is Holtzman technology. Holtzman technology is basically based on sound, sort of. Um, well, I guess it creates sound waves. And sound is what draws the worm. Sound is what, you know, brings the worm to your location. Why do you think, you know, Fremen use thumpers to call worms to ride them? And the fact that he called it Holtzman Tech, not, you know, uh, not leaving it at shields and suspensor belts, you know, calling it Holtzman Tech, again, a reference to the actual terminology in the universe. Obviously, everything you'd expect to see in a survival game. It's water discipline. It's the surviving the sandstorms, the sweep across Arrakis. Then we have politics and intrigue, which speaks to the faction gameplay of the game. It's about, you know, siding with one of the factions, thinking about how they work together, perhaps assassinating members of the other factions. Then there's infinite exploration. Infinite exploration, which is one of the things I'm most excited about, is how the world changes over time. We have a concept called the Coriolis Storm, and when it sweeps across the landscape, the sands shift, revealing new points of interest, hiding others, making the game renewed every week. Okay, that concept and that system definitely intrigues me. Um, because for one thing, you're not going to be able to 
make the game or make the world completely you're not going to be able to make the world different all the time you know i'm i'm sure you know if a storm uncovers say like in this in, in this footage say this base gets uncovered by a storm I'm sure that what's going to happen is the next week, if it get, if the space gets covered up, then, you know, granted it may take a long time for it to happen, but eventually this will probably get re-discovered, but it won't change. And, you know, with content creators being the way they are, there are going to be people that are going to explore every inch of that base and post it on the internet. So, yes, it gets covered up next week. But say, three months down the line, it gets rediscovered. You can go online and find a video that takes you through each step of it. You know, every inch of that base is already on YouTube for you to go find, which isn't a bad thing, but it does eventually become stale. Then we have combined arms. Combined arms is our combination of vehicles, melee combat, range combat, and abilities all working together to create a seamless sandbox combat experience. And finally, we have expression and customization, which is really more than just talking about like the visual expression and customization, which of course we have armor sets and clothing and a, and a robust character creation. But in addition to that, it's really about play the way you want to play. If you want to be a trader, you can do that. If you want to be a fighter, of course you can do that. If you want to be a spy, maybe that's the gameplay you're looking for. All of these things built into the utility. Now, once again, he's talking about roles, you know, stealth. Um, is stealth going to be or how are they going to pull off stealth? I want to I want to visualize it as kind of splinter cellish. You know, you're crouched, you're keeping to shadows, you know, you're 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 avoiding combat if you can and sneaking around. But I want to go back to something. No, that's not it. This. I don't know if anybody noticed when they were originally watching this, but if you look close, you can see that still suits are tiered. So, I'm assuming that means that the tier of the still suit determines the effectiveness of it. Uh, filtration, protection, that 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 kind of thing. Because the still suit isn't just for you know turning the body's moisture, sweat, urine, you know solid waste, all that into drinkable water. It's also to keep you cool when you're in the deep desert. So and clothing and a, and a robust character creation. But in addition to that, it's really about play the way you want to play. If you want to be a trader, you can do that. If you want to be a fighter, of course you can do that. If you want to be a spy, maybe that's the gameplay you're looking for. All of these things built into the utility. Again, that just looks very Mass Effect. That looks, you know, it's a vehicle moving across the desert. It looks like the um, the go anywhere attitude vehicle you had in Mass Effect. You know, when you landed on or when you went to a planet to explore it. So, Anarchy Online, when we started, um, Anarchy Online was a huge undertaking for Funcom at the time. 
Um, we didn't always know what we were doing, but we were learning on the job to a large extent. As Funko now has a long track record of MMOs, um, we know we're not new when it comes of uh, challenges relating to server technology, to uh, relating to player population balancing, uh, with relating to the RPG uh, aspects of it. So everything that went into the earlier MMOs that we did comes into play here. Uh, we are taking it a lot further though, because we're not a traditional MMO in the sense that there's combat in our game is much more second to second and intense than you would find in an MMO, for instance. It's much based on uh, the second to second experience, how melee, how ranged, how gadgets and abilities, how grand. By the way, I didn't even put this in my notes, but it, 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 it kind of intrigues me. You know, they had a model for a leaking still suit, you know, um, How is that going to come into play? Vehicles, how air vehicles, how it comes together uh, in the ultimate uh, challenge that is getting spice. In Dune Awakening, PvP is about large-scale competition and small-scale competition. Players in guilds competing for spice resources in the world. Now, PvP can be done on many levels between players, right? It doesn't necessarily mean players killing players. It can also be players out intriguing other players finding ways to give them false information, tricking them into going to the wrong area to look for a spice block, or perhaps like misleading them into looking in, in, in an enemy base for the wrong thing, right? In our game, spice is obviously very important. I like that. The fact that you can actually sit there and play with your enemy's head and misdirect them and, and feed them false information. It's a very novel concept in PvP. The mechanic as it is in Frank Herbert's stories. Uh, as players consume spice, they unlock the ability to level up skills in the game. And those skills, as you train them, you choose which ones to train, you have active skill training. As you train those skills, the more spice you consume, the more you're allowed to train. If you don't have a lot of spice in your blood, you obviously can't train as much. However, this also comes at the cost of becoming woefully addicted to the spice. I love that aspect too, you know, Spice is highly addictive in the Dune universe, so using it to learn stuff, I mean, Spice also opens up your mind, it's a, um, it's a hallucinogenic, it's a, uh, It's kind of an amphetamine, you know. Tying in skills with spice and tying in addiction with that just makes me kind of giddy. <laughs> um, now, the one thing that worries me is is this going to be like EVE Online, where eventually it t you get to the point where to learn a skill, it takes you, you know, you start the process of learning that skill, and it will take you, you know, a week to finish learning it. That's one of the reasons I won't play EVE Online, because I don't... I don't want to play Set Timer Online. <laughs> So the journey of the player, we've divided that into four parts. Um, we think of them as survive, protect, expand, control. The survive part means that you're up against the planet itself and you're clinging on to life. In the protect phase, uh, you have gathered some stuff, you might have a base, uh, but you also want to make sure that nobody else comes to, to take it away from you. So you try to build defenses and make sure that your base is in the clear. Then in the expand phase, you lift your gaze and you look around and you see that others have stuff as well. And you might want to take their stuff. Uh, then in the control phase, you may find yourself being a part of a guild or even the leader of a guild. Then... Now him talking about the ability to go take people's stuff 
concerns me. That that's something else about the you know Canley system. Can my guild set up a base in a safe place? Yeah, maybe I can't make it as big or have as much stuff in it, but you know, can I? Basically, I don't want to play Rust, where somebody has to be on all the time to make sure that your base is defended. The goal is to control the flow of spies on Arrakis. However, you're never safe. Uh, there's always someone lurking around the corner. Can you really trust your second in command? So. The goal of the control phase is that you are clinging to control. In Dune Awakening, we have a wide array of combat capabilities. Um, infantry consists of melee with knives, swords. You have ranged weaponry, gas-powered, blast guns. Um, you have gadgets, you have abilities. Uh, and building on that, we have ground vehicles, we have air vehicles with their own combat com uh, capabilities. Um, and when all of this comes together, you find yourself in the desert uh, in a spice harvesting operation. Uh, and there might be another guild uh, attacking, attacking you to get your spice. And whenever you get into combat in the desert of Arrakis, try to get it over with quickly. Because not only are you fighting human combatants, but the planet Arrakis itself is the greatest protagonist there is. As you're fighting in the desert, uh, there might be a sandstorm rolling in, and the sandworm will be attracted to the vibrations that you cause. So get it over with quickly, and then return to solid ground. Also, I love the aspect of you want to get the fight over with as fast as you can, so you have to, you know, balance. You know, are you going to take a huge force with you. Because of course, you know, if you want to make sure you get a fight done o done quickly, go in with, you know, massive firepower. But at the same time, you don't know what they're bringing. And all this machinery causing vibrations and is going to call a worm. So yeah, I, I like the fact that you need to get into combat, you know, dominate the combat scene or dominate the battlefield and get out. So, I mean, I love to interact with the community. You should join us on our Discord channel. You should go to Steam and wishlist us so that we know how many people are excited about our game. And of course, go to juneawakening.com and sign up for our beta. So overall, I'm pretty intrigued by this game, as if I wasn't before. It looks interesting. Some of the concepts they're going to introduce are interesting, especially the Coriolis. Yeah, I'm very excited. Can't wait for the betas to hopefully be part of, and can't wait for the game to come out. Thank you for watching this video, if you are indeed still watching. Your support means a lot to me. Please like this video if you did like it, and subscribe if you are not already subscribed. And ring the notification bell so that you will get notified when I upload new videos. You can also get updates from Twitter and Instagram, both at cptjamestduck. Once again, thank you for watching. Until we meet again, remember, fear is the mind killer.